In this very important message, we discuss the role of true spiritual fathers and mothers and expose some of the errors, misapplications and abuses. This morning we're going to deal with a topic that um, we probably never preached on this on our Sunday morning. We've uh, talked about it in our pastors' conferences and those kinds of settings. I don't think, as far as I remember here, I don't think we've talked about this on a Sunday morning. And uh, so this may be uh, the first time we are dealing with this subject in the Sunday morning service. Uh, just one good, good news, good news, good report. Our testimony came in last Sunday. We preached on healing, all of that. There was somebody who was watching us online. Uh, and I, I, th- these, are only the, these are the only details that came in the email, so I can only share what is in the email. I don't know all the other questions, so don't ask me how long and all the <laughs> details. Details that are not in the email, I can't answer. But here's what the email said. This lady had been having a lot of uh, pain in her chest for some time. She'd been to the doctor. They'd given her medication. Nothing uh, happened. I mean, she didn't get better. She had this ongoing pain. She knew that we were preaching on a Sunday, that Sunday morning on healing, so she decided to tune in. She was watching us. She received prayer and everything cleared up. Amen. She waited till Monday and I think on Monday evening she sent the testimony of her healing. Right. So that's all we have. That's the only news. Don't ask me what was the actual condition. (laughs) I don't know. This is what she said. But we just want to thank God uh, for that testimony that came in through somebody watching us live. All right. So this morning we're going to talk about spiritual fathers and mothers. Spiritual fathers. Fathers and mothers. Uh, one of the reasons as, as a team, as a team of pastors, we sat down together uh, some time back. And we said we, need, we needed to deal with certain topics. And so these three Sundays, today, next Sunday, and the Sunday after, where we're dealing with some difficult subjects simply because of what we're seeing happen in the Christian world. In the, in the Christian world, what is going on? And we're looking at some of the misapplication of spiritual truth. And it causing a lot of problems to God's people. And so we felt that it's good for us to bring a right understanding on these things before you are confronted with, you know, out when you go out there in the world and you watch it on TV or on YouTube or some place you attend and you hear these things. It's good for you to be armed with the truth so that you will be able to discern error when it comes at you. And with that intent, we are presenting these three messages this Sunday, the next two Sundays, addressing certain topics uh, that we feel the church is being confronted with globally. Uh, I'm not saying a particular church in Bangalore, but I'm talking about the global body of Christ is being affected by these things. And so we are addressing this. And so this morning, we're talking about spiritual fathers and mothers. Let's begin by first looking at 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 to 14. We'll start with these verses. Uh, we'll probably go through several different scriptures today. They are all in the sermon notes. Uh, so if you have your phone, you can go to our church website, open up, the church, or open up the notes and follow. Or you can use the church app and the notes are there as well. You can follow along. First John chapter 2 verses 12 to 14. Now, the first epistle, this first epistle of John the Apostle, most likely, and this is not confirmed, we don't know for sure, where he wrote it from and to whom he wrote it, or whom he wrote it to. But this is what is likely. He most likely wrote First John while he was in exile at the Isle of Patmos. So Patmos was, uh, 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 was an island not too far away from the, uh, what we would say, the uh, modern day, the west coast of modern day Turkey, not too far from the seaport of Ephesus. And there were the seven other churches in Asia Minor, not too far from each other. So it's most likely that Paul John wrote this epistle while he was in exile on the island of Patmos, and he was writing to a a letter that would be circulated among many churches. So he was not writing to a particular church, unlike, you know, the Paul's epistle to Ephesus or uh, Corinth and so on. But he was writing a letter that would be circulated across many churches in in Asia Minor. So these seven churches that we read about uh, in in the book of Revelation, they were among these recipients. So uh, keep that in mind. He's addressing communities of believers. And here's what he writes. He says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 12 onwards, I write to you little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to your fathers, because you've known him who was from the beginning. I write to you young men, because you've overcome the wicked one. I write to you little children, because you've known the father. 
I have written to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the wicked one. What I want to highlight here is that while he's writing to the group or these, the groups of or communities of believers, he is addressing people by their, what you could call a spiritual age. He's using these terms, little children, young men, and fathers. Now, we understand it physiologically. Physiologically, people go through these stages, from being children to young men to becoming adults, fathers and mothers. So, he's using that same terminology, but in a spiritual context. Are you all with me so far? So, here's the thing. God wants all of us... Now, we all start off as little children, spiritually. But God wants all of us to grow up, to become adults, and then become fathers and mothers. All of us are to grow up, to become fathers and mothers in God's house. And so you see this kind of terminology used in other places in the New Testament. We'll just quickly make some reference to it. Uh, in 1 Peter 2, 2, he's referring to as newborn babies, spiritually. In 1 Corinthians 3, 1, Paul talks about being spiritual, that is mature, or being babies in Christ. In 1 Corinthians 14, 20, he says, being children versus being mature or fully grown up, adults. Uh, in, first, in Ephesians 4, 13 and 14, he talks about being a mature man, a fully grown man, versus being children who are tossed to and fro. In Hebrews 5, we see being babies versus being a full age. So the point is this, that there are different stages of spiritual growth and maturity, and all of us should become fathers and mothers. No one has the luxury of remaining little children forever and ever. Amen. Now you've got to grow up and become fathers and mothers in the house of God, in the family of God. Now, when we say fathers and mothers, it has nothing to do with your physiological age. That means spiritually, you can be a father or a mother, even if you're just a teenage person, or a 20-year-old, or a 30-year-old. It doesn't matter. Spiritually, you can become a father, a mother, spiritually. Regardless of what your bio, biological, physiological age is. Are you with me? And the goal is we must become, grow up to become fathers and mothers. So we want to talk about that and in the process deal with some of the misapplication of the truth which has caused harm to the church and, and so on. So let's try to get a definite understanding of what does it mean to be a father or a mother. Paul, first of all, begins, in, uh, he, he addresses this and we, un we understand one of the primary distinguishers of somebody who is a father or mother is that they have the capacity to reproduce. They reproduce. So Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 15, writing to the Corinthians, whom he refers to as his children, spiritual children. He says, For though you might have 10,000 instruct instructors or teachers in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. So he said, look, I've given birth to you. So bringing somebody to the faith is like you are birthing them. Of course, it is God who gives them new life. But you are in the process. You're helping in the process. You're helping them come into the kingdom of God. You are being a spiritual father or mother. That is, you're bringing people into this new life that we all share in Christ Jesus, as Paul did uh, with these Corinthians. But in addition to that, it's not just the ability to reproduce, but being a father or being a mother is more than just giving birth to children. You've got to take care of the children. So a, a proper definition of a spiritual father or mother would go like this. One who nurtures another from infancy to adulthood. It's a process of nurturing that the emphasis is on. And it's taking somebody from a place of immaturity to maturity. Or from one level in God to another level in God. 
That's being a spiritual father or mother. And all of us can do some of that. Amen? Yes or no? It's okay to say amen in church. <laughs> so, all of us can do that. So, how, how do we be, how do we be true spiritual fathers and mothers? And we can learn a lot from looking at the uh, uh, life of the Apostle Paul as he worked with Timothy and Titus, whom he called him, called them as his spiritual sons, how he dealt with the Corinthians and other churches that he planted. We can learn a lot by observing how he relates to them. And uh, we just want to highlight a few uh, aspects of being a true spiritual father or mother. So first of all, you nurture by word, spirit, and life. How do you nurture people spiritually? By word, spirit, and life. Three things that go into nurturing people. The word of God, the work of the Holy Spirit, and your own life. And we'll just make one reference. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, Verses 10 and 11, Paul is writing to his spiritual son, Timothy, and he says this. He says, Timothy, you have carefully followed. That means you observe very carefully. You have watched this. You know, so Paul wasn't living in some crystal cathedral, and he just float in on Sunday morning and do his thing for three hours and disappear. The rest. No, no, no. It wasn't like that. He said, Timothy, you have carefully followed. You have seen my life. You have carefully followed, first, my doctrine. That is my teaching. You've, you've heard me teach the word, the truth concerning the kingdom. You have carefully followed my doctrine. Number two, my manner of life. Timothy, you've seen my life. My life is, is, is open to you. You've seen me as a person. Not just somebody on the pulpit who's preaching and teaching you here, but you've observed me. You've seen my love. You've seen my purpose. You've seen my faith. You've seen my long suffering. You've seen my endurance. You've seen my persecutions. You've seen my afflictions. Timothy, you've seen all this in me. That's how Timothy got to be Paul's son. Spiritually. That's how... Timothy was nurtured from being a young disciple to being a man of God. Are you with me? And that's what I'm, we, are call, we are all called to do. To nurture people by word, by spirit, and by life. Are you with me? That means we got to live with our feet on the ground. Let people touch you. Go on mission trips together. So they can see you when you wake up with all your hair you know, out of place. Not on Sunday morning when we all look nice. <laughs> but when you're in those hot places where you're sweating and, and you're cramped in a little room with so many people. And, and then let's see what comes out of you. Amen? I, that's when we get to see the real you in those difficult situations you've carefully followed you've seen my afflictions you've seen what i've gone through you've seen how i love people you've seen my purpose the how i live for the purpose of god Timothy, you observe these things so how do we nurture people through word through spirit through life secondly a true spiritual father would a mother would nurture with love and discipline it's not only love True love comes with discipline. And all earthly parents will say, Amen. <laughs> we know it. <laughs> and so, so also in the realm of the spirit, when you're dealing with spiritual things. Look at this one example. When Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says this, and many parents will, you know, will just relate to this so well. 1 Corinthians 4.21, he tells them, What do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love and a spirit of? You can just picture the mother standing with a little child or the father. Standing with a little child. What do you want? <laughs> do you want a spank? <laughs> or are you ready to obey and you'll get this reward? <laughs> so Paul is putting it out there. He's telling the Corinthians, what do you want? Do you want me to come with a rod? Because a shepherd does have a rod. Or... 
Do you want me to come with love? and gen- How do you want me to relate to you? There are times when you have to use the rod, that is discipline. There are times you deal with love and gentleness with people. So that's, that's important when you're dealing, uh, when you're nurturing people. Yes, you love them. You're compassionate. You're kind. But then there are times you've got to address issues. Number three. That brings us to number three, where as a spiritual father, mother, you deal with difficult issues. You talk about uh, uh, real life issues. You deal with character weaknesses. You deal with recurring problems like losing jobs, getting into debt. Uh, Why are they going through it? You deal with unresolved emotional issues. Because those emotional issues, issues can cripple people in life. So you deal with those things. You talk about it. Now here's the problem. Most of us like to hide behind our gift. Because we like to hide behind what we're good at. So, you know, when you come to meet pastor, pastor I mean, oh, I, I, pastor, my, 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 my ministry is going so well. You know. Whenever I preach, pastor, the fire of God comes down. They won't tell you when they got home, different fire fell. <laughs> they will talk about the ministry. In the kitchen, another fire happened. <laughs> they won't tell you. So you've got to say, okay, that's nice. In the meeting, God's fire fell. How about things at home, in the kitchen? <laughs> with your spouse, with your children, how are things? Oh, pastor. <laughs> that's when <laughs> the other side of the story comes. But that's what you've got to deal with. Because if you don't deal with that, everything in the public will go waste one day. And that's a true spiritual father, mother. They deal with those issues. They say, let's talk about it. Let's try to fix those things. Let's deal with those issues. So you come into that relationship to deal and nurture people with those things. Number four, you develop them into uh, their calling. Yes, of course, you want them to be all that God wants them to be. You encourage them to, uh, to grow, to exercise their gifts, find their place, become what God wants them to become. Number five, you release them at the right time. Just because God put them in your life doesn't mean you own their life. No. God put them in your life or God put you in their life for a season. To bless them, to take them from one place to another place. And you've got to have the wisdom to recognize when it's time to let go. You see, if you have a little eaglet and you're feeding it, taking care of it, the eaglet becomes an eagle. But if you keep the eagle in a cage, it will die in the cage. An eagle is meant for the skies. And you will have the wisdom to let the eagle go. So it can be what God designed it to be. So that's a true spiritual father or mother. They recognize that God has brought me into their life for this season. I'm going to do my bit. And after that, they are free to be what God wants them to be. And number six, uh, as a true spiritual father or mother, you will celebrate their success and rejoice when they outdo you. Every true father or mother wants their children to be better than them. I mean, true. If I have passed 10th standard, I'll say to my children, at least do 12th. <laughs> Just be a little better than me. Hey, I have managed 10th. If you do 12th, that's great. And I'll push them until they at least do 12th. That's a true father or mother. I mean, do you agree? That's, that's the heart of a true father or mother. So also in the spiritual that every true spiritual father and mother wants their son or daughter to do better than them. And when they do better than them, they, it's a joy for them that somebody that God used uh, them to bless are now doing much better than them. That's the truth. Now here are some things they will not do. First of all, they will not violate divine order. You see, God has authority structures for different units in life. There is the authority structure for the family. The husband is the head of the house, not the pastor. So wives, submit to your own husbands, not pastors. Some wives will say, I'll submit to the pastor, not the husband. No. Wives, submit to your own husband. That's divine order. Well, that's God's order. Uh, There is divine order for the local church. Okay, the pastor is in charge. There is divine order for the workplace. Your boss, your manager, you're accountable to the person who is your superior in the workplace. There is divine order for government. God has put people in authority and you submit to them. Now, when you are nurturing people 
a true spiritual father, by the will not violate that. Meaning, if you are nurturing, for instance, you're, you're nurturing a husband, a man who's a husband, you will not tell him to abdicate his responsibility as a husband. No. What you do will make sure he becomes a better husband. The same is true if you're nurturing, uh, if, you, uh, if one of you ladies, you're nurturing somebody who's a wife, you will not tell her to dishonor a husband. Whatever you do will make sure that she aligns herself to her husband. Are you with me? See, for me, in this, in this role as a pastor, I do have people come from other churches uh, to get some help, to get some guidance. And it happens all the time. Now, when they come to me, for instance, a couple of weeks ago, a young man came. He's just maybe about 21. He's from an AG church in our city. He doesn't come to APC. But he came. He said, Pastor, I, I'm just starting. I'm launching a ministry to young people. So, a young fellow. Starting just on November 1st, he's going to be launching that ministry. He says, you know, Pastor, I need you to guide me. Now, he doesn't come to APC. So, after he explained what his ministry is about, I said, first, to start with two things. First, I will never violate you. This vision has been given to you. You are the boss. I may be more than two times older than him, but I submit to you because you are the vision holder. So whatever I say is all under, you have to check it out with God. Number two, I will not violate your pastor. Whatever I say, you take it back to your church pastor, work under him. After I said those two things, we began our engagement. So even now, I continue to engage with him, but these two things are clear. And I say anything to him, I say, take it back to your local church pastor. Are you understanding? Because that is God's authority structure. I will not violate that. I may input, I may shape, I may, you know, he may be so open that I could just shape in the entire thing, the youth ministry that he's doing. But two things I will not violate. Because you honor God's divine order. Doesn't matter who you are, you're submitted to it. The second thing a true spiritual father and mother will not do is they will not violate, they will not control or manipulate. Are you still with me? Or did he get off on two stations back? You're still on the same train? All right, still going. <laughs> we will, a true spiritual father or mother will not control or manipulate. That means they do not use their position or spiritual authority to get their own agendas done through the person they are nurturing. Think about it. Here's this one example, one reference here. 2 Timothy chapter 12, verse 17 and 19. Paul is writing to the Corinthians. He says, did I take advantage of you by any of those whom I sent to you? I, uh, I urged Titus and sent our brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Did we not walk in the same spirit? Did we not walk in the same steps? Again, verse 19, he says, again, do you think that we excuse ourselves to you? We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things, beloved, for your edification. He says, look, did I take advantage of you? Did any of my team members take advantage of you? No. They have, we have spiritual authority, but we will not use our spiritual authority for any of our own agendas. Are you listening? That's a true spiritual father, mother. And you're only seeking their edification. So you say, what do you mean? Sometimes spiritual fathers and mothers are guilty of living their dream through their sons and daughters. Just like in the natural. You don't do that. You've got to nurture them up into their call. Into what God wants for their lives. Now, I'm going to say something that may be a little strong, and it, but yet it's true. Spiritual control and manipulation is witchcraft. Spiritual control and manipulation is witchcraft. Now, we all talk about the dark side of it. You know, somebody wants, they go to some person outside, they say, hey, can you do some magic Make that boy love me. <laughs> so that guy, he cuts a chicken's head, he cuts something and he does something, <laughs> he causes it. That is witchcraft. 
What is it? It is spiritual control and manipulation. Now, same thing can happen in the church. Where because somebody is trusting you and saying, uh, no, they're relating to you and you're being their father or mother. You have a spiritual authority in their lives. Now, if you use that authority to control and manipulate, it's the same thing. But it's being done in the church. And it's witchcraft. So prove it from the Bible. Glad you asked. Paul is writing to the Galatians. And, uh, you know, Paul has come and preached and he's gone. And other people have come and they're preaching a different doctrine. And then Paul writes to them in Galatians 3.1. He says, oh, Galatians. Who, oh foolish, he calls them foolish. Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Oh, strong word. The Greek there has the meaning of using pretense and magic to control. Same as witchcraft. But this is the context, is the local church. The context is through teaching. The context is through what they are preaching. They are practicing, they're controlling and manipulating the people. And so he's saying, who has bewitched you? And then he continues, and I'm just picking up a few verses in Galatians 5, and he says, you know, you're once again come under the yoke of bondage. There's a bondage now over you because of their teaching. And then he says in verses 7 and 8, he says, you know, this thing is not of Christ. He says, you ran well, who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who? God. Are you with me? So a spirit, true spiritual father, mother will not do that. They will not control and manipulate uh, people that they have uh, access to. And a, a related thing in number three is they will not abuse their spiritual authority. That means they will not use their uh, uh, authority to control the faith of somebody. They will not use their authority to dictate how they live their lives. They will not use it for their personal gain. That means no favors in return. I'm very careful. People can come to me, I can impart to them spiritually, but I make sure I don't ask them for any favor. Can you, you know, give me a special room in the hotel? Can you bring me this, bring me that? No. You don't do that. You don't abuse your authority that God has given you in their lives. Are you listening? Now Paul writes, for instance, for the Corinthians, he he says in 2 Corinthians 1.24, he says, Not that we have dominion over your faith, but we are fellow workers for your joy. Look, we don't have dominion. We don't control your faith. We can help you. We can nurture you. But we will not dictate your personal walk with God. Are you with me? Number four, they will not attack, attack or pull you down if you go beyond them. That's a true spiritual father and mother. In fact, they'll be happy. A bad example is that of Saul and David. You know, the entire nation of Israel was so scared to fight Goliath. But here comes David and he kills Goliath. Everybody should be happy. And they are happy. They're singing their song. Saul has slain thousands. David his ten thousands. And Saul says something's wrong. He gets jealous. And out of jealousy, he wants to destroy that's a bad example. He's not being a true spiritual father. Number five, they will not prevent you from receiving from other true ministers of God. They will not say things like, we are the only pure stream and you must only drink of this stream. All other streams are contaminated. You will not hear that. See at APC, we don't tell you don't go to this meeting. Don't visit that church. Don't read that book. Don't watch God TV. We don't say those things. Please watch God TV. Our program comes on it. <laughs> we don't say those things. Because we know that in the body of Christ, God has placed many ministers. And we need to receive through all their lives. One man doesn't have it all. One church doesn't have it all. That's why God has a variety of ministers and ministries. And we have to receive through their lives. But carefully, the good things. But a true father mother will not say, don't receive from there, from there, from there. No. Because they know they don't have everything to give. 
Amen? So, I want us to bring our attention to something. Some errors in church history. It is important that we learn from past mistakes. It is bad to keep doing the same mistakes over and over again. And that's one reason I personally like to read church history. Especially charismatic church history. And one of the things you'll find out in, especially this is not too long, recent history of the church, was the shepherding movement that came out. It actually started in the 1970s. It began with what was then known as the Fort Lauderdale Five. There were five ministers of God. They all got together. See, these are good ministers. They just made a mistake. So we're not knocking them down. We all make mistakes. So, but this is what happened. They came together in Fort Lauderdale. They were called the Fort Lauderdale Five, well-known ministers. And uh, they came out with this teaching on spiritual covering. And that every person, every believer had to have a spiritual covering. It was called the shepherding movement. And, and it, took, it, just, it just spread globally in the 1980s. Everyone will be talking about that. And uh, so basically it was a pyramid structure. One man on top, everybody under, everybody reporting to somebody else on top. Everybody had to be under a covering. Now, to some extent, it is the application of spiritual fathers. You need somebody to help you. Wonderful. But it pushed it to us an extent where it became so harmful and so damaging to the body of Christ. Churches around the world, believers around the world were so hurt. And there are volumes of books written uh, recording all the abuse that took place. Because of the shepherding movement, it impacted our own city as well. Because this, this, the application of that went into such extent where, you know, what I mean, you couldn't do anything without reporting to your cover. I mean, if you if you wanted to eat Italy, and I'm being silly now, if you wanted to eat Italy, and your spiritual covering told you to eat dosa, you had to eat dosa, otherwise you sinned against God. Literally came down to that. I've read of real stories where when a church was conducting uh, some games and the pastor wanted one particular team to win, that team had to win because he was the spiritual leader. I mean, it became so ridiculous. The body of Christ was hurt tremendously. And the good thing was at least three of these five leaders in the 1980s openly came out and apologized for their teaching. And they made public statements that what they taught was wrong. The problem was by that time the teaching had already spread all over the world. And the beautiful thing about the church is this. Like how clothes come in and out of fashion every time. Old errors come back in new packages. And that's what we are seeing happen today in the church. It's these same errors that really destroyed the church around the 1980s being preached today under the name of apostolic prophetic people. They say things like, you've got to be under my covering. You've got to be attached to me. You've got to submit to me. Whatever, whatever, whatever. However, the language, the language is a little different. The Packaging is different. The error is the same. Are you listening? So that's why we are presenting this message to us as a church. Here are some of the errors. And this is not, not necessarily a full list of misconceptions and misapplications. And abu just abuses of a valid spiritual truth. It is a valid thing to be a spiritual father or mother. But if you push it and apply it wrong, you'll hurt people. Now here are some errors that you will hear. Number one. If you don't have a spiritual father or mother, you have an orphan spirit. I've heard that told to me. Because somebody asked me, who is your spiritual father? I said, I don't have a spiritual father. I mean, my teacher, the school teacher led me to the Lord. But after a year, he went to the US. And ever since then, I've been on my own. So I don't have. Oh, orphan spirit. <laughs> Listen, the correct understanding is we are all born of God. And God has given us His Holy Spirit, the spirit of adoption. God has no orphans. 
Error number two <laughs> is you have to be connected to a spiritual father or mother to receive from God. The correct understanding is Jesus said, I am the wine. You tell them, I'm a branch on the wine. I don't know which wine you're connected to, but I'm connected to Jesus. The Bible says, as believers, we are all in Christ. It's not that you are in your pastor, your pastor is in the bishop, and the bishop is in the apostle, and the apostle is in Christ. It's not like that. You are in Christ. That's the truth. But you'll hear this error being preached. Error number three. Your spiritual lineage is important, just like your biological lineage. You know, we have DNA sampling and they can tell you all your family tree and you can know whether you were supposed to have been a prince someday <laughs> and you can be proud about that because you know uh, 10 generations back he was the maharaja of timbuktu you know <laughs> be proud about your biological lineage now You'll hear the same thing being preached. You need to know your spiritual lineage. I mean, you need to know who's your spiritual father, who was the spiritual father of your spiritual father, and who was the spiritual mother of your spiritual father's father, and so that you know your DNA. Rubbish. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the firstborn among many brethren. That's my lineage. I'm a brother to Jesus. You're a brother to Jesus. We belong to the family of God. Connected to God Almighty. Stops there. I am not God's great, great, great grandson. (laughs) I and you, you and I, are children of God. Directly born of God. That's the lineage. And because we are in Christ, we happen to be Abraham's descendant. Direct. No Isaac in between. Serious. The Bible says you are Abraham's descendant. Direct connect to Abraham. Nobody in between. That's the only two things that matter. Error number four. You cannot go beyond the level of your spiritual father or mother. The correct understanding is you can go as far in God as you want to. Bible says, God says, seek me and you will. No, nobody is stopping you from doing that. Jesus said, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. Drink as much as you want. You can go as deep as you want in God. Nobody can stop that. Last one, number six, or sorry, number five. Sorry, which one was it? Number five, two more. You operate under the anointing of your spiritual father or mother. You see, we do receive through our spiritual fathers and mothers. They give into our lives. Grace is imparted. Anointing is imparted. On uh, October 28th, we'll talk in detail about impartation, what it is and what is not. Yes, we do receive. But there is only one Holy Spirit. We are all anointed by the same Holy Spirit. Yes, there are different kinds of anointing. Some may be anointed to do this and some may be anointed to do that. But there is only one Holy Spirit who anoints all of us to do different things. So, you are not operating under the anointing of your spiritual father or your spiritual grandfather. You are operating under the anointing of God, Holy Spirit. Under His presence and power. John 3, 27, a man can receive nothing unless it's given to him from God. Whatever you have, it comes from God. Others can lay hands on you. God can use them, but ultimately what you have is from God. 2 Corinthians 1, 21, Paul said that the one who has anointed us is God. Not reverend so-and-so. Amen? Amen? Your anointing is from God. The last area we want to talk about is 
If you don't have a spiritual covering or spiritual authority figure over you, you're vulnerable to the devil. The Bible never says that. But the Bible says things like Jesus said, I'm giving you authority and, the, and nothing will by any means hurt you. He didn't put a qualifier. You have to stay under the covering of John Jim. No, nothing will by any means hurt you. 1 John 5, 18, whoever is born of God keeps himself and that wicked one cannot touch him. You're born of God, keep yourself. The devil can't touch you. You're not vulnerable. You're born of God. I understand. Now, of course, if you violate the authority that you're part of, authority structure you're part of, then you get into trouble. For example, if, you, uh, if we violate the law of the land, you get into trouble. You know, on the traffic light, you get caught. Don't say, I didn't have spiritual covering. No, you ran the traffic lights. You violated a law, an authority structure that was in place. That's all. So, just would like to close now. Two things I want to mention before we close. One is to break free from abusive spiritual fathers and mothers. If and I don't know, I, I don't know, you know, everything in everybody's lives, but if there is anyone here yeah, that you're under such kind of a spiritual control, we want to encourage you this morning to break free. Don't stay. You don't have to stay. Break free. Now, what I've observed is many times when you try to break free, you'll get threats and warnings. Fire and brimstone will fall on you. A tree will come on your car. <laughs> All these weird warnings they will give you. Because they are upset that the truth has set you free. But don't be afraid. You are in Christ. Amen? You don't have to be afraid of those threats and warnings. Just walk out of that relationship. And lastly... Your, our response to this whole truth on spiritual fathers and mothers, firstly, is I want to encourage all of us to rise up to become fathers and mothers. It simply means you nurture other people in the faith. That's all. And all of us can do it. You, don't, you know, whatever your physical age is, don't let it hold you back. Maybe a young person, you can start, you can help somebody else. You can give what you don't, they don't have. Just give it to them. You're nurturing them. Just a little bit. Do. But I want to encourage all of us to grow, to become fathers and mothers. It's a call for all of us. And actually it's a joy that you'll be able to help somebody else in some way make some progress in their spiritual journey. Now, please, don't go around saying, I'm a spiritual father. <laughs> no, please. This is just language we've used to communicate today. Just be a person who helps somebody else. That's all. And don't go around saying, I have 10 spiritual sons and 20 daughters. <laughs> Please. Don't do those things. Nobody wants that. Don't talk about those things. Just, just be you. Just let people be blessed through your life. That's all. And... You know, again, when somebody else says, so-and-so is my spiritual father, you know, sometimes I question the motive. You know, are they trying to take, you know, run under that person's brand or something? You know, so, so just be, you know, you don't, we don't have to necessarily use this language when we talk. Just be yourself. Be grateful for those who have given into your life. That's wonderful. But don't, don't need, there's no need to go around saying so-and-so is my father and, uh, and all of those things. Yeah. So be fathers and mothers. Number two is honor true spiritual fathers and mothers. If people are blessed your life, honor them. But don't worship them. They're just human. Honor them. But don't. You know, don't put a picture of them here. This is my mother. Put <laughs> flowers. <laughs> Every day you put flowers, burn candles. He's my spiritual father. Please. They are not God. They're just human vessels who helped you at a certain stage in life. That's it. That's all. Don't worship. You worship, we all worship God. Honor, be grateful. 
don't worship them. Some people take this to such an extent, so we need to say it. You know, just honor and uh, be grateful. And uh, number three is maintain this truth of spiritual fathers and mothers in its right place. That means this is true. It is the Bible talks about it. I'm not saying it doesn't. The Bible talks about it. Being a spiritual father and mother, blessing people, building people up. It does talk about it, but it's got to be maintained in its right place. Don't misapply the truth because it, it can hurt people. Amen? So keep it in the right place. It has its place. Ultimately, you and I must walk with God. That's all. Amen? Let's rise to our feet, please. I'll call our worship team up this morning. We'll just take a few moments to pray. There's more on this subject, uh, which probably we'll put in, a, in print. Uh, but this is sufficient for us uh, to st- help us stay on track. Next Sunday, we'll talk about another interesting area called the Prophet's Reward. And we will address that issue next Sunday. But this morning, let's just pray together. Let's pray. And you pray and ask the Lord, Lord, help me be a true spiritual father or mother. Now, some of you, I know, you're already being used by God to nurture others. And that's, that's great. Just keep at it. Just bless people's lives to whatever, uh, in whatever way you can. Just keep doing it. <clears throat> but for some of us, maybe we can start. So this morning, just pray and say, God, you know, one day, I'd just like to help other people in their faith journey. Could you help me to do that? Help me be a father or a mother to somebody. Help me do this, oh God. Father, even as we stand before you this morning, I ask for a release of grace. A release of grace. Over each one of us, Father, that we will be fathers and mothers in the house of God. That you will use us to nurture other people in their faith, in their journey with you. Release grace. And Father, I pray that you will impart into each of our lives the grace, the anointing, the wisdom. Let it come into our spirits to be fathers and mothers. Release, God, this whole process of multiplication in our midst. That by the Spirit, multiplication will happen. There will be a new people born into the kingdom and many nurtured in the faith. Because as a community, we are being fathers and mothers. Thank you, God. Thank you. Let your hand come upon each of us. Let your spirit be on each of us. Empowering us. To raise up sons and daughters. To bless people. Let's take a few moments to worship.
will seek your face with all of my strength. And I will seek your face with all of my life. For you are my God. You are my God. You are my God. For you are my God. You are my God. And I will worship you with all of my few moments right now to pray for people who've been hurt by the church maybe you've been hurt by other people in church church people maybe you've been hurt by leaders in the church and maybe you're still carrying the, the pain of that inside you it's not gone it's still there I want to pray over you just keep in mind that people are people nobody is perfect church people are people leaders are people they're not perfect so take your eyes off people and look to God I want to pray and as I pray I want you to do something Ask the Lord to heal you. Ask the Lord to help you. Release forgiveness to those who may have hurt you. And ask the Lord to release you from the pain of that which you're still carrying. Father, even as I pray right now, we do this together in the name of Jesus. We pray for those who have been hurt in the church inside the body mistakes that have been made oh God forgive the mistakes let your mercy be both on the one who committed the offense the one who was offended we pray your mercy Most of all, Father, right now we pray for your healing touch on the wound, the pain on the inside. Let it be taken out. And every spirit of offense, of unforgiveness, leave right now in the name of Jesus. Let every spirit of bitterness and hatred leave in the name of Jesus and let healing come to the womb. Healing come. Right now, let there be a release. Thank you. Thank you. We honor you. Before we close this morning, is anyone here you've never received Jesus Christ into your life? Some of you may be watching us 
life. Some of you may be here. If there's anyone, you've never received Jesus Christ into your life as your Lord, as your Savior, the one who forgives your sins, who gives you a new life, who makes you a child of the living God. I want to take a moment to pray for you, pray with you before we close. The Bible says that everyone who receives Him, to them He gives them the power to become the children of God. You can become a child of God this very moment when you give your life to Jesus Christ. I want to lead you in a simple prayer. If you feel impressed in your heart to do this, please pray this with me if you've never done this before. Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive my sins. Come into my life. I believe you died for my sins. You were buried and you rose up again. I place my life in your hands. Help me to follow you and you alone the rest of my life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Anybody? You prayed this prayer with me for the very first time. Uh, we'd like to celebrate with you. So if you don't mind, could you put your hand up? We'd like to celebrate with you. Anybody who prayed this prayer with me for the very first time? Just raise your hand. Up. One, two. Praise God. Anybody else? Anybody else? One, two, three. One more here. One more hand here. Just put your hand up high. Our greeters will come and give you a green bag. There's one more person right here. Right here in the middle, uh, this side. Just put your hand up. And bless, bless him. Uh, there's a green bag that we would like to give you. It has free resources that you can take back with you. There's also a card that says decision card. If you don't mind, please just write your name and your number. Um, and give that card back to the greeter. Somebody from the church office will call you and give you instructions how to use the contents that are in that bag. And they'll help you on your journey. They'll be a father to you or a mother to you. They'll help you on your journey and, and make you strong in God. Uh, anyone else, if you pray that prayer but you didn't raise your hand, on our exits, our greeters will be there with this green bag. Just tell them, hey, I didn't raise my hand. Can I have it? Just write your name and take the bag with you and we will be in touch with you. Let's close, please. Father, we thank you for your truth that sets us free. And now, Lord, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship, of your Holy Spirit, continue with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.